Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yeah, you never saw it coming. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And we want to give a shout out to our friends at KXNT AM 840. It's a news talk station in Las Vegas, Nevada. And we are proud to be part of their weekend lineup now with Extreme Genes. I know there's got to be a lot of great family history stories to be had in Las Vegas, Nevada. Of course, this is the week of Roots Tech in Salt Lake City, Utah, so everybody's tied up with that, including uh, David Allen Lambert and myself. So we figured, okay, we're going to do kind of a best of thing this week, some of our favorite interviews from past shows. And then next week, we're going to give you the full review on a lot of the things you may have seen at Roots Tech or missed if you weren't able to attend. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So coming up in about eight minutes, you'll hear my visit with Dr. Emerson Baker from Salem State University talking about how he and his committee actually were able to confirm the location of the site of the execution of the Salem witches. Incredible. And then later in the show, I'll talk to the Jersey girl, Sue Wynn, about her discovery that her fourth great grandmother was buried and viewed twice over several years. You'll want to catch that. But right now, let's check in with my friend from Beantown, David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. How are you, David? I am great. It's been an amazing week of excellent lectures and meeting some of our amazing listeners here at Salt Lake City at Roots Tech this year. Yeah, it's going to be so much fun to review this whole thing. we got a lot of pictures up, of course, happening on our website, ExtremeGenes.com, and on our Facebook page. Hope you're following us there. Hey, don't forget also to sign up for our newsletter, The Weekly Genie. You can get that by just signing up at ExtremeGenes.com. It's free. No, we don't sell our list to anybody, so uh, enjoy. we got a lot of great links to a lot of great material. One of the people that we should have on our newsletter list is Queen Elizabeth II, who just celebrated her 65th Sapphire anniversary. That's what the 65th is. I don't think I'll ever live to see that. That's that's incredible. That's that's pretty amazing. It makes her the longest reigning monarch in history. Right. She came in in her mid-20s, right? She did, yeah. 65 years ago when she took the throne after the death of her father. She is a very healthy non Nigerian. She is 91 this year. Wow. In connection with that, I had a very weird experience recently in regard to someone related to the British monarchy. Okay, because most of us have some royal connection. Uh, anybody mm-hmm. who has any British history at all usually can find something way back there with a little luck, right? Right, like King Edward I is very common, yes. Henry II. But King Arthur of the Knights of the Round Table. What? <laughs> I had, yeah, I had a gentleman come in and was certain that he knew by family tradition that he was related to King Arthur. <laughs> oh, it doesn't end there. He also said, and he is distantly related to Merlin. No. Oh, stop it. <laughs> no, I really wish I can't make this stuff up. No. Uh, this will definitely be for a luncheon talk, uh, Tales from the <laughs> Reference Desk down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, needless to say, I had to go to lunch quickly after that uh, engagement. And sure. I'm not sure what chart he'll produce, but I'd love to see it. Well, you know, some of the stories I give each week for Family History Hour News are from around the world. And, of course, I'm in Salt Lake City for Roots Tech, but this story goes right back to Beantown, where the first subway system in 1897 started under the streets of Boston. PBS is doing a new series on the American experience called The Race Underground. You know, you think of the subway system here in Boston, we just take for granted, but how hard it was to build something like that 120 years ago. Oh, yeah. No question. And, and, you know, I I have the New York background, and I was thinking that maybe New York subway system was ahead of Boston, but it wasn't until 1904 that New York got their first rolling. But they were actually ahead when it came to the L system. They actually had an elevated train that ran through New York starting in 1869. So I guess the latter half of the 19th century, these guys were doing some amazing things. In fact, between New York and New Jersey, they dug a tunnel 
underneath the Hudson River so they could connect to Grand Central Station, which to me is astonishing for the 19th century. That's a daring accomplishment. You know, when I was a kid, I actually knew a lady who was a toddler when she went on the second car where the public could go through in the first Boston subway. Same lady who told me about remembering when McKinley was assassinated <laughs> in the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. And this is interesting, David, because you obviously did this when you were very young. She was very old. But it reminds us there are still many among us who remember things now that will be long forgotten. It's a great time to get out a recorder and tape those people's memories. Speaking of memories and stories, we always have cousins that we haven't talked to in a number of years. But Yaffa Kaplowitz was watching a ceremony that was televised in Israel. And one of the speakers, also a survivor of the Holocaust, Zaheva Roth, started to speak about her family. Yaffa realized that it was her cousin who she hadn't spoke to since before the Holocaust she was seeing on television. You're kidding me. I mean, we're talking about closing in on 80 years, right? Really is. And that generation, we're losing so many of them. And just to think a television show has now reconnected people that have not seen each other since the 1930s. It's just an amazing, unbelievable. amazing thing, yes. You know, there's nothing like the discovery of something new in your genealogy. MyHeritage.com has recently released their new discovery pages, which combines their smart matches and record matches in such a way that you're able to see everything all at once. Well, and you know, when you're trying to connect with European cousins, there's really nothing quite like what MyHeritage does. And by the way, of course, full disclosure, MyHeritage is a sponsor of the show, and we're very proud to have them just for that exact reason, right? Exactly. One of the things that I want to offer our listeners, if you're not an NEHGS, AmericanAncestors.org member, you can go on and get a guest membership for free. However, if you want to be a regular member, which is eighty nine ninety five per year, put in the checkout code EXTREME and you will save $20 on any level of membership. Talk to you next week from Boston. All right. All great news, uh, David. It's been great seeing you in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we'll get caught up and get everybody else caught up with what happened at Roots Tech in next week's show. Take care, bud. Take care. And coming up next in three minutes, one of my favorite interviews from the last couple of years, a visit with Dr. Emerson Baker from Salem State University talking about the confirmation of the site of the executions of the Salem witches. It's coming up on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. 
Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, the radio root sleuth. And, uh, of course, last week we were talking with David Allen Lambert from the New England Historic Genealogical Society about this amazing confirmation in Salem, Massachusetts, about the location of where the accused witches were actually hung. And I'm very excited to have on the line with me right now Emerson Baker. He's a professor at Salem State University. He's one of the people who was part of the team that made this confirmation. How are you, Professor? Good. Glad to be with you, Scott. I sure appreciate your coming on. And uh, I know we have so many people who descend from some people, lots of individuals associated with the Salem witch trials. I know I'm one of them. David is one of them. Perhaps you do, too. But I run into them all the time. People who descend from the accused, the accusers, the judges, the juries. Uh, It is just amazing how far-reaching that particular incident is. And for you as an historian, this had to be quite a fun thing and an exciting thing for you to be a part of to finally confirm what has been known for some time, but you've actually added some new scientific leverage to it to confirm where these people met their ends. Uh, I I really wasn't prepared for how powerful it would be, the reaction we got from people. We have such an overwhelming and and amazing response, uh, in particular from descendants. And and yes, you're right, I'm I'm a descendant as well. I actually am a descendant of Roger Toothaker, who died in prison. He never made it to the gallows, Mm -hmm. actually, Uh, while awaiting trial. Were any Uh, men actually uh, hung in this situation? Oh, yes, absolutely. I believe, what, actually like five, including, of course, the most famous um, Reverend George Burroughs, yes. uh, the, the ex-minister of Salem. So uh, in, in most cases of witchcraft, including Salem, about 80 percent of the accused are women. So it really is kind of a female crime. And Salem sticks right to that as well, too. But you talked about how many descendants there are. A year or so ago, I wrote a book on the witch trials called A Storm of Witchcraft. And in it, I talk a little bit about the witch city and the whole phenomenon and why it's so well known today. And to me, one of the reasons I think it's so well known is because there are so many descendants. I mean, uh, if yes. you think that there were more than 150 accused, more than 200 accusing them, more than 200 defending them, more than 50 judges and jurors, and numerous other people involved, that when I give a talk, I say, you know, if you don't have an ancestor who was involved in the Salem witch trials, the person sitting next to you probably did. They really, right. <laughs> you know, it, it really is our event, our, our tragedy, uh, a national tragedy, not just Salem's, because if you think about it, you know, you, you multiply those people and go out 9, 10, 11 generations, and that's a lot of descendants. So as you went about this, obviously it's been known or at least strongly suspected for a long time that this area of Proctor's Ledge in Salem was the location. What did you have to do to confirm this conclusion from the past, and who came to that conclusion some time back? Right. Well, we were really working on the work of the great uh, Salem historian of the early 20th century, Sidney Perley, who in 1921 had written an article where he really felt that even though people had placed it, there'd been a kind of a collective amnesia, I think, as they'd forgotten where the execution site was. And Pearlie reviewed all the facts, all the documents, no direct evidence, but a lot of just sort of hints as to where it might be. And he was pretty sure that it was Proctor's Ledge, which is actually on the lower part of Gallows Hill. And ironically, a few years later, in 1936, the city of Salem actually purchased a small piece of land there specifically to build a memorial. But I think at the time there were some people that were still hesitant about who would rather literally bury this than remember it. 
And uh, wow. nothing ever happened. And people continue to believe it's the top of Gallows Hill. It's this location as opposed to another. And we were brought together about five years ago, a team of us of historians and, and scholars, to work with the city to see if we couldn't come up with the actual site. And that's what we've been working towards since late 2010. Now, you were on a committee of about seven, yes? Yes. And, and that included particularly where there were other historians who were expert in the Salem witch trials. Marilyn Roach, who's written extensively about this, several books. Benjamin Ray of the University of Virginia, myself, and the other important scholar we had working with us was my colleague in the geology department at Salem State here, Professor Peter Sablock, who used some of his remote sensing techniques as well, too. So it really was kind of a, a team effort using not only the traditional histories and the documents, but some other new things that Pearlie couldn't have done. Well, tell us about that, some of the scientific things. What could you detect using modern equipment in that area of Proctor's Ledge? Well, the most important thing was the the work done by viewshed analysis, uh, GIS work with aerial photography that was done by Benjamin Ray and his people working with him at the University of Virginia. Viewshed analysis, simply put, is you can take an aerial photograph and determine with topographic features and determine what lines of sight people have And we were able to figure out, we know there were several kind of distant eyewitnesses to the witch executions, and knowing approximately where they were, we were able to determine through viewshed analysis what parts of Gallows Hill they could or could not see. And Mm. indeed, many people have placed the top of Gallows Hill as the location, and we didn't like that for a lot of reasons I could get into if you want, but the real clincher was the fact that from where these people were standing, they could see the lower part of Gallows Hill around Proctor's Ledge, but they could not see the much more distant top of, of Gallows Hill, which really helped us pin down the location. So do you think that was the one thing that really kind of, uh, to, to use an expression, put it over the top? Yes, it did. But I also think, too, frankly, you know, Marilyn and Ben and I have studied the witch trials for many, many years. And for the three of us to all look at the documents, which are now available online at the University of Virginia website, and to sort of kind of independently arrive at that and look at Pearlie's research and then compare our notes and argue it out, that was important as well. And the other piece, too, that was really important, of course, once we determined this a couple of years ago, we were pretty sure, frankly, as sure as we're ever going to be, we're never going to have that direct evidence, I don't think. But then the next question we knew that people would logically ask, is, well, what happened? Where are our ancestors who were the victims? What happened to the people? So that's where Peter and his geology students came in and did what we call geoarchaeological remote sensing, soil resistivity, and particularly ground penetrating radar, going over the grounds at Gallows Hill to see, was there any evidence of human remains that could lie buried on the, on the hillside? Now, Gallows Hill is obviously misnamed because you've concluded that that there were no gallows involved, yes? There were no gallows involved, exactly. And in fact, actually, Peter's research, the good news was, first off, there's really nothing that we could find on this piece of land. No evidence of any archaeological features, no physical evidence of a gallows being constructed there. And in fact, actually, there's very little dirt on Gallows Hill, no more than a a foot or so. Most of it, if you've seen the pictures, is just sort of naked ledge. Sure. So kind of the relief to us was that there really doesn't seem to be any evidence of, of any human remains on the property. And once we knew that, we knew we could really responsibly announce our our findings. Um, We didn't want anybody running to Gallows Hill with their shovels or anything like that. Oh, (laughs) yeah, that would uh, be disturbing. This is Salem, Massachusetts, right? I mean, you know, it's it's, it's a different kind of place. Now, this is... Scott, I should say, I I kid about that a little bit. I I just met with a lot of the the local tour guides this morning. And frankly, people here want to be very respectful and are very concerned um, about paying proper respect and and, and not turning this into a tourist attraction. And that's that's what this is about. This is about marking the site and seeing that it's cared for. We don't want it lost again. But this is not a, another tourist dot on Salem's map. And that's really important to all of us. Right, right. Now, well, first of all, it's a residential neighborhood now, is it not? Yes, that, that, that honestly, that is, that is part of it. It's not just being respectful to the deceased for not, we want to get just a simple monument there. But it's also literally in people's backyard. It's a postage stamp of a lot that's probably no more than about a quarter of an acre, and you, you were quite literally looking into about the back doors and windows of about a half dozen homes. Uh, how do they feel about this? You know, it's interesting. Some of them have known about it for a long time and have been, and have been very protective and are pleased about that. Uh, one of the fellows whose family has lived there for a couple of generations told me about proudly about how the day this big black limo pulled up, and he could look in the back window and see Yoko Ono, and as he said, and that beetle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, he, they take great pride in that. And they've kind of kept it safe because they kind of knew that was the location. But some of the neighbors are genuinely concerned. It's a narrow one-way street. They're really concerned about people parking there or coming in and disturbing the site. So we're trying to be respectful of them 
and the city is working carefully with the neighbors and any other interested parties, including the descendants, in planning for the site, seeing whatever kind of light and fencing we might need to safeguard the neighbors to keep the parcel protected, but at the same time to be able to have a site that's respectful of the horrible event that happened here. And those brave 19 people who refused to change their beliefs would have been so easy to say they were a witch and would have lived uh, because only the people who pled not guilty were executed, but they refused to do that. So this really is an important memorial to those people who who were really Christian martyrs. Do you see perhaps a ceremony that's done on a semi-annual or annual basis so that you're not spreading it out throughout the course of the entire year? Well, the good news is ever since the 300th anniversary, we already have a really wonderful memorial in town. It's administered by the Salem Award Foundation, who actually every year gives a major award for human rights activism in honor of the victims of 1692. So we're trying to encourage people to go to that really wonderful memorial on a regular basis. But having said that, if people come, especially across the country from Salem, we know that they may want to visit the site. I've already had a lot of the descendants contact me that want to be there for when this site is dedicated. Also, too, in Salem, you may know this, there's a substantial Wiccan community. And in the past, every year on on Halloween, which is Samhain, their High Holy Day, the fall solstice, they do have a ceremony up on Gallows Hill as well. They may well want to try to move that to this location. But again, it's a very small spot, so it, it isn't the kind of place where you can bring a couple hundred people together very easily. So it needs to be accessible to some degree. And these are the kinds of things that we're still working out. And again, only after we announce this, can we start talking to the community and all the stakeholders and see what is the proper long-term plan for this site. How many people living in Salem right now are descended from people involved in this incident? Well, let me put it this way. I can't give a lecture without a couple people at the end coming up. I, in my book, I estimate, I'll bet you there are at least 100 million people who were uh, around the world who had some relative involved in the Salem Witch Trials. And I really don't think, if your family's been in New England more than a generation or two, it's hard not to have some connection to it. It really is. He's Professor Emerson Baker. He's the author of A Storm of Witchcraft, The Salem Witch Trials and the American Experience. Thank you so much for coming on and talking about this uh, amazing experiment that has resulted in a confirmation of a very unique place in American history. Oh, you're welcome, Scott. We'll, we'll, we'll keep informed as the process moves forward. Sounds great. And coming up next in our Best of show, we're going to talk to Jersey girl Sue Wynn about the discovery that her fourth great-grandmother was buried twice and viewed twice over several years. That's coming up in five minutes on Extreme Jeans, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. And 
welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, the radio root sleuth, talking to another one of our listeners, this one in Clementon, New Jersey. Sue Wynn is on the line. Hi, Sue. Welcome to the show. Hi, hey, Fish. Great to talk to you. I am so excited to hear your story here and, and having got a little peek at what you're going to talk about. I <laughs> it is amazing, the stories that can come from our past, and, and you've got one. How did you get started in your research, by the way? Well, about 20 years ago, my father had passed away previously, and my father's cousin was still alive, and he started telling me some of these family history names. Although he didn't know a lot of the older stories, but he knew some names. And it was about 15 years ago, because I'm a Jersey girl, been here most of my life. I said to my husband, why don't we go try to see if we can find some of these gravestones down in Mullica Hill. So we went on a mission down there and we were looking through a couple of graveyards and I'll be darned if we didn't come up with some of these gravestones. And one of them, well, two of them, Hannah Agging, who's my fourth great grandmother, and her husband Enoch, who's my fourth great grandfather, were buried in St. Stephen's Episcopal Church Cemetery in Mullica Hill. So I ended up contacting the pastor of that church because I couldn't really read the gravestone very well. Right, and maybe there's burial records that he could help you with. Exactly, and so I talked to him on the phone, and he said, interesting story about your fourth (laughs) (laughs) great-grandmother. So it turns out that my poor fourth great-grandmother, Hannah, died when she was about 55 years old, and she was buried in the graveyard of the then St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, which was a little bit further down the road from where the church is located now. Well, they decided, after she had passed away, that they were going to sell that church property. Well, they decided to also, at the time, dig up all of the remains of those who were in that little cemetery and move them along to the new church property make it easier to sell the old church property, I would imagine. Yeah, right. I, mean, I don't think anybody wants to build their house on a graveyard. <laughs> so, Makes it tough when you're um, digging for the swimming pool, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so apparently there's this, I don't know if it's an element or exactly what it is, but it's, it's called marl, and it's something that's found in the soil there in Mullica Hill area. Okay. And they've also found quite a few fossils in that area. As you can imagine, after about four years of being in the ground, the coffin had disintegrated quite a bit, as well as the others. But what they didn't expect to find was that her body was so beautifully preserved after four years in the ground. And this was quite the news spread throughout the area, and there was so much interest in it that they actually held a viewing (laughs) after four years of kind of being in the ground. Four years in the ground and a second viewing. And not only that, my fourth great-grandfather had remarried. So can you imagine? (laughs) Well, that's a little awkward. A little awkward. So apparently her hair was still pretty and curly, and her face was marbleized and very interesting. So they held a viewing, and they reinterred her, and she to this day is in the ground in Mullica Hill at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. However, in Mullica Hill... Being the old town that it is, and in the spirit of Halloween, every year in October, they have something called the Ghost Walk. Oh, no. So it's about an hour and a half (laughs) program, and you walk through the town. Well, it turns out that my fourth great-grandmother, Hannah, is one of the ghosts represented at the Ghost Walk. Oh, wow. She stands out there in the cemetery, and someday my aspiration is to be... Hannah in the ghost walk to play and Hannah. my fourth great grandmother. <laughs> what a great idea. So, yeah, uh, you know, I often wonder how she feels about that being represented as a ghost, but it is what it is. I mean, hopefully she takes it in, in the good fun that it's meant to be. I, I think that is exactly right. So where was this record, by the way? I mean, you're, you obviously have a lot of details about this, including the husband and, and his remarriage and the whole story about how the body was preserved. What record did you find that in so others might be able to do the same kind of thing? Well, this particular story was found in the parish register of St. Stephen's Church. 
So they have kept pretty good records and pretty detailed. And, you know, so often we go searching for our ancestors and there's nothing but names and dates because they haven't written anything about themselves. Nobody's written anything about them. And this particular church did a really great job of keeping records because I know about my fourth great grandfather as well, Enoch. Really? Uh, Yeah. It says that he was a small, wiry, athletic man who farmed a small place of 20 acres and for many years kept one of the village stores. He was a most esteemable man and respected by all who knew him, was a man of sterling worth in every way, of a gentle, kindly disposition, and left a memory that is lovingly cherished by all who knew him. And he was the vestryman and warden of that church and one of the the originators of the parish. So they wrote about him as well. So this was all in church records. Well, that's that's an exceptional church record, though, nonetheless. I mean, I don't want to give the impression to people that you're going to find records like this everywhere you go. In fact, if you find out who the historian was who recorded those things, you ought to put a flower on his grave because he did a great job. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I feel this connection to Hannah and Enoch because of those little excerpts of things from their lives, and I know about them now. Right, it's a right. beautiful thing. Do you know anything about Hannah's life? I mean, you know about her death and what happened afterwards, but have you actually learned anything about her, her life? Well, that is the sad thing. I really don't know a lot of details about her life, and I'm curious and would love to know. I mean, I know a little bit about her husband. I know where they lived. Right across the street from the church, there's a house, and it has a plaque on it. This is the Enoch Aggings home. But no, I mean, the only thing that I really know about them is that they had uh, a couple of children that passed away when they were very young because they are buried with Hannah. One was about 18 months old, the other about two years old. And they obviously had my third great grandfather, right. Carl, who I descend from. Don't you think that a, a lot of the, the women in the households from back in those times were actually defined by the family, obviously? Yes, I'm sure they were. I'm sure they were. So knowing what I know about Enoch, I'm assuming that that she also was a lovely woman. Yeah, similar nature. Exactly. All right. So where are you going from now with all this? Gosh, I'm hoping to go further back. Now, there is a gentleman by the name of Hugh Agging who lived right next door to Enoch, and I'm guessing Hannah as well. And he has a Revolutionary War pension. So my next goal is to try to link those two for sure as father and son. And who knows, maybe my daughters and I can join the DAR. So what records have you checked to try to link Hugh to Enoch? Well, one of the things that I looked at at the Gloucester County Historical Society was land records. And from that, I knew that Hugh and Enoch had lived next door to one another. But other than that, I just have not been able to find anything. There's got to be a will for him someplace. No, I have not gotten that far yet. You might also want to look into uh, letters of administration. Also, go to Fold 3, look into his military records. Often the military records will contain a family Bible record or a family Bible page that could list all the names of the people in the family and pretty much give you the relationship as well. Yeah, that's a great idea because he did. He was a Revolutionary War pensioner, so... Would love to make that connection. Well, and to have the pension, you might also see some uh, name patterns come up, unusual names. Perhaps his father was Enoch as well. That would give you a good, strong hint. And certainly being right next door, I think you're right. You know what you've got to do, and you know that what the relationship likely is. Yeah, that's a great tip. Fish. All I'll right. Definitely follow through with that. Well, great talking to you, Sue Wynn from Clementon, New Jersey. And uh, what a story about your fourth great grandmother, Hannah. Good luck. I do hope you get into the Halloween thing, getting the opportunity to portray her. I think it would be a blast. <laughs> I think it'd be a lot it of fun, too. And coming up next, Tom Perry, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. You know, everybody needs a place of their own to plant their family tree, preferably one that no one else can mess with and only you can control. That perfect place is Roots Magic. Roots Magic has been a family history standard for years, and now Roots Magic 7 is on the market. It's an award-winning genealogical software program which makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easy. You can start from scratch or import data from other software or even family search. Roots Magic 
also automatically finds records relating to your ancestors from MyHeritage, FamilySearch, and soon Ancestry and Find My Past. You can use it to create beautiful charts, reports, and books. And have you ever thought about making your own family history website? Roots Magic can make that happen too. And of course, there are free videos, guides, and technical support to help you along. Isn't it about time you planted your family tree? Whether you're a beginning genie or experienced professional, Roots Magic is the perfect tool for you. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. It is preservation time on Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. And we do this every week where we go through some of your questions. And we also mine the great mind of Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, our preservation authority. Hi, Tom. How are you? Is that a different Tom Perry that you're speaking of? (laughs) Well, this is a great email we got from Dusty. Dusty says, I have a VHS tape that has a family interview that was done in the late 1990s with a family member that is no longer with us. I tried transferred it to DVD, but the audio is so bad, I have to turn the volume on the TV all the way up in order to hear what's being said. I still have the VHS. Are you able to transfer the VHS to DVD and fix the audio? Good question, Dusty. What do you say, Tom? We have that come up quite often. There's a couple of different things. Is the audio bad because it's low? Is the audio bad because there's noises in the background? What exactly is the problem? So the first thing you need to do is send it to us, and we'll load it into our computer, and we'll listen to the audio. And if it's a volume thing, that's not that big of a fix, but it's not going to be that expensive. If it's something really bad, like there's pigs oinking in the background or refrigerators humming, then what we have to do is we have to write what we call an algorithm, which basically finds those tones and pulls them out. And then if it's consistent through the entire tape, we just set up the algorithm, run the audio through it, and then it's pretty much gone. Now, those algorithms, I take it, do not hit the same frequency as the human voice, right? Exactly. That's where you have to be so careful. If you just look at the part that's bad and do an algorithm to remove that and where it crosses the human voice, you're going to have a lot of problems. A lot of sounds are either below or above the normal human voice or even people are talking. Because if you're talking about somebody that's their interview is almost kind of monotone, then it's really easy because they have such a small range in their voice. So there's a lot of technology that's into this. If you're a DIY person, you can get Adobe Audition and you can kind of do it yourself because it takes these different wavelengths and they're different colors. Oh. And so you can sit and listen to it and kind of while you're watching an Adobe Audition say, oh, his voice is a blue part. 
So you don't want to mess with the blue part. So then you basically, with a stylus pencil, go and remove the yellow and the green and the orange and maybe some of the light blue and some of the really dark blue. And then when you remove that, it's going to bring the volume down, but yet his voice is still pretty much preserved in the way that you know Uncle Ted talks or whatever. So then you can take that part and actually amplify it. And then some of the little parts of the refrigerator noise or whatever that crosses his voice are going to kind of get drowned out by bringing his voice back up. And so when you do this, it sounds so much better. And a lot of times these new TVs have the bass and the treble. They have all kinds of different adjustments you can make. But if this is something you want to do for your family, it's pretty much too late for Christmas now. However, if you want to do things for them in the future, you can take these things and clean them up and make DVDs. Because you don't want to send it off to somebody in your family and say, oh, by the way, make sure you turn your volume off, do this, do this, do this, because then they're not going to listen to it. There's a lot of things you can do. And like the cost, as he mentioned, it depends on the length of the tape. If it's a long one, it's usually about $25. And to actually do the transfer and then the audio, we're guessing it's a simple thing, like a volume thing. So it's probably going to take about 15 minutes to do it, so about 25 bucks, so $50 for the whole transfer. And that's typical of places throughout the country? Yeah, just about any place you go, that's about what they're going to charge you, walk-in place. Most people are pretty flexible with what they're doing and pretty compatible with prices. If you ever run into somebody, and I have people complain about this all the time, you see people on the Internet that's doing something that's like half price of everybody else. The person knows what his work is worth, so be really, really careful. Read the reviews on the Internet and see what people have said, if they're happy with them, if they're not happy with them, and that'll help a lot. Unless you're on such a tight budget, it's like, hey, I have to do it at this cheap rate or I don't get it done. It's better to do it at a cheap rate than not do it. However, always remember, keep your tapes, keep your video, keep your film, keep everything. Don't throw it away. Coming up in the next segment, we can teach you how to have your unborn children and all other relatives <laughs> love family history. You'll start a whole new generation of people that love family history. All right. Coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. 
genie.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for The Weekly Genie. And we are back. Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, the Radio Root Sleuth. It's our final segment with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, our preservation authority. Now, Tom, you were talking before the break about how we can get future generations of unborn children and grandchildren to love family history forever. What do you got? This is back to the science thing, like we talked about quantum physics a few shows ago about how to store your stuff on the cloud to make sure it's taken care of and it's not taken by other people and have access to it. Well, this is something really, really new that scientists are now able to do. You know how your genes work. If you have blonde hair, your husband has dark hair, blue eyes, green eyes. Some of your kids will be blonde. Some will have blue eyes. It's just kind of a... Random thing. Exactly. But with the master gene, if you go and change the sequence in that, it's permanent. For instance... Fruit flies, which is what they always start with because they're easy to right. you know, breed and change And nobody their gets mad about them. Exactly. And they breed so fast you get, can get a new generation a couple times a week. Yeah. <laughs> so what they did is they went and took black fruit flies yes. and they put a blonde sequence in the master DNA. Uh-huh. And so every single one of their offspring were blonde. There's no blacks at all, 100% blonde. So if we take this same thing with us and put the family history gene oh, into stop every... it. Now, wait a minute. No. We're going to program it into everybody that they're going to preserve and share and discover? Exactly. Stop it. You don't have to worry about anybody <laughs> losing your stuff down the road. Everybody's going to have it. It's going to uh-huh. be wonderful. Yeah, get, move on. What do you have? The next thing I want to talk about, <laughs> we've talked about 3D printing before. Yes. And the biggest Very problem cool. people have with 3D printing is it's really, really slow. And we've talked about family heirlooms, so you can take them and make 3D copies of it so everybody has a pseudo copy of what it was. Right. But they're slow, they're cumbersome, et cetera. Well, there's a new one that they're working on right now that works out of a polymer type thing. So what happens is it has this liquid polymer that the 3D printer actually goes down inside the polymer. And as it pulls it out, there's kind of like a photo, a picture that is done with light and oxygen, the light and the oxygen mixing with this polymer causes it to harden and liquefy and harden and liquefy as it's coming out of the vat. It's almost like sci-fi. Like you see this human form come out of this liquid (laughs) mess. This is exactly how this 3D printer works. It pulls up this polymer and it zaps it with this light from this photograph that's in the vat and says, okay, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here. So it's so much faster and it's a lot better. Once the form comes out, all you do is basically hose it off And it's ready to rock and roll. You don't have to get down and sand it. It is absolutely incredible. How much faster? Over 100 times faster. Whoa. They're going to be expensive. However, they're working with different businesses that this will be a part of their cash, so to speak. So we could have one of these in our place. People could bring in an old watch, any kind of an heirloom, and we could actually photograph it, put it in the vat, and they could pick it up next day. (laughs) That's insane. So many times when somebody dies in your family and everybody wants this, well, with something like this, we can actually take it and make you another pocket watch, make you whatever. It won't be functional. However, it'd be a replica of the original one, and you could go in and paint it, do all kinds of cool things with it. It's just absolutely amazing. Because like I say, one of the biggest problems with the old kind, say you're making a round ball, it's not perfect. You're going to have to kind of sand it down because it takes out these strips, turns them into liquid, forms them really, really slow, doing one layer at a time. Where this one, as the thing's coming out of the vat, is just shooting it with oxygen and with light. And if you want some more information, get the latest copy of Popular Mechanics. 
Super fun stuff. All right. Interesting. Boy, where are we going? The mad scientist. Great stuff. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. And that's what we call in the biz a wrap for this week for our best of show as we're all out enjoying Roots Tech in Salt Lake City, Utah. So next week, of course, we're going to tell you all the things that went on there, some of the new things we're learning about, some of the new technology that's going to help you with your research. It's going to be a lot of fun. David will be back. Tom Perry will be back. Check out our Facebook page. Lots of pictures and videos posted there as well. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember... As far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family.